Good morning. Uh, do turn with me to Daniel chapter 6. Uh, Daniel 6, there's going to be lions and a den. Familiar story, but very relevant truths. Uh, while you're turning to that, uh, just a little bit of an introduction about myself. Uh, I grew up in the north of the island in uh, Derry, uh, born and bred, and have lived in England for well, a fair, fair amount of time. I used to be a teacher. Uh, I taught physics. There's a great conversation opener or closer, depending on how you uh, deem physics. And I've been uh, working, uh, serving in churches for the last number of years in the London area. Um, and it's a, it's a joy to be with you, uh, with my wife and uh, son. Uh, let me read from Daniel chapter 6. This is the word of God. It doesn't matter where we've come from in many respects we come under the word of God and we get to hear from the living God Daniel 6 so the story has been moving forward Daniel and his friends and chapter 5 the writing was on the wall and it was the end of the Babylonian empire chapter 6 verse 1 it pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. At this the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it is something to do with the law of his God. So the administrators and the satraps went as a group to the king and said, O King Darius, live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce a decree that anyone who prays to any god or man during the next 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, O king, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the laws of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they put to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any god or man except to you, O king, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, The decree stands in accordance with the laws of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pray, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men went as a group to the king and said to him, Remember, O king, that according to the law of Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve, continually rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the rings of the nobles so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king went up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? 
Daniel answered, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I done any wrong before you, O king. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language throughout the land, May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is a living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth. He has rescued Daniel from the the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Amen. Let me pray before we come to consider this powerful, dramatic story. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the living God, the one true God whose kingdom is everlasting. And as our King, our great King, we ask that you would speak because your servants want to hear and live in response to that. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I was in Costa Coffee uh, a number of weeks ago, and I got to the end of the the queue, and the lady uh, said to me, do you have the loyalty app? And I said, once again, no, I don't have the loyalty app. So I'm not loyal to to Costa Coffee, but we, we live with this question of loyalties. We have huge numbers of loyalties, whether it's your, your sports team, uh, your, your school, the, your work, your, your family, the list of loyalties is huge. But what happens when loyalties clash? When they come in conflict with one another, your work versus God, your sports team versus God, your family versus God, anything else versus God. Well, our ultimate loyalty will be the thing that comes out as top. And our ultimate loyalty is the thing in our life which has ultimate value. It's precious. And the story of Daniel 6 is so important because we see in this how Daniel can be ultimately loyal because he gets who his ultimate God is how valuable and precious his God is. So, so why can, can we be ultimately loyal to God as the pressures rise in Ireland or throughout the world when Christians are persecuted? How can they be ultimately loyal? Well, Daniel 6 shows us ultimate loyalty is because of the ultimate God a person has. Daniel is ultimately loyal because God was the ultimate for him. And that's why the the doctrine of God matters so much. Because when we have a small view of God, we will have a small loyalty to him. But when we have a, a huge view of God, a right view of God, we will be able to be ultimately loyal to him amidst rising pressures and perhaps even persecution. So we're gonna, we're gonna work through this dramatic story and see that under the, the title, Loyalty Amongst the Lions. And there are four little movements in the drama, the first of which is the tension. And you can follow along in verses one to three as we go through the story, the tension. We at this point in, in Daniel have a new kingdom on the scene, Persia and the Medes. Uh, the big king is Cyrus over this, this realm. And Darius, it appears, is the king over Babylon. The Babylonians are gone. We've had the rise and the fall of the Babylonian Empire. It doesn't last. 
And, and Darius now, it, it appears, is wanting to, to solidify or secure the kingdom. Uh, and so he places a hundred satraps, that's leaders, in his kingdom. Uh, and verse 2 then tells us that he appoints three administrators. And did you notice that in the, in the part of the story? It would so that he would might not suffer loss. And it's, it's as if the, the employee, you're now in the company, and there's just another takeover. Oh, here we go again. A new administration's coming in. Or maybe another government's re- now in power. Oh, it's going to be the same old thing. Will, will Daniel be able to live faithfully in this kingdom? Will you and I be able, as things change in Ireland, to be faithful and loyal to God? The administrators are put in that position with authority. Does, does that just show you that this kingdom is quite insecure? That they might suffer loss? It doesn't sound that stable. And as the story continues in verse 3, you see that Daniel is very competent at his job. He, he stands out above. He is competent, and others don't like that. Daniel is a great example of what it looks like to serve the Lord in administration, to be working for the Lord. But his confidence, his competence is not without character. We're going to see that in the story, and there are tensions that come as a result of that. You ever felt the tensions in the workplace where there's maybe backstabbing? People are just waiting for you to slip up. Maybe in school, somebody's just waiting for you to, to mess up and then they'll pounce on you like a lion. Well, that's what Daniel has here. Verse 4 goes on to tell us there. They tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They couldn't find any corruption in him. They couldn't even find any negligence within Daniel. He was loyal to his employer, but he had an ultimate loyalty, as we will see. Daniel here, as the story is painting him, is a righteous one, an innocent one in this particular example, who's done nothing wrong. And as I read the passage, the tendency sometimes in the book of Daniel is to try and say, be more like Daniel. And when I look at Daniel and I see him as this righteous one, this innocent one without charge, I think that isn't me. I make mistakes. I have limitations. I make failures. It sounds more like another person, the Lord Jesus Christ, the righteous one, the perfect one. And so, this is a sketch of someone greater, someone perfect, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, the tension is there, and it's set up. They're wanting to trap him and destroy him. So, that moves us on to the second scene in verses 5 to 9, from the tension to the trap. A trap is being set. Hunters, when they're trying to get a lion on occasions, have dug a huge pit and then covered it over with leaves as they wait for the animal, the unassuming animal, to walk over and then be captured, fall into that pit. And that's what these satraps and administrators are trying to do. It's a subtle, it's a deceptive trap. And it will make Daniel have to answer a simple question, which I think chapters 1 to 7 is asking of the reader, whose side are you on? There's one of two sides, God's side or against God. Who is Daniel going to be ultimately loyal to? And and the trap there at the end of verse 5 is something to do with the law of God, the Bible. We can think, if, if I do everything right as a Christian, you know, just don't make any mistakes, just be a good person, I'm never going to have any trouble. Well, Daniel 6 says that that is not a necessary assumption that we can make. No matter how good we are, the law of God, the Bible, is where issues will come. That is where the tensions and the conflicts come. When the Bible says this, will we follow the Bible where we have to live with the consequences 
that come from that. And it's so easy to say, I follow the Bible when there isn't any opposition. When people try to trap Christians, it will be related to what the Bible says. And, and chapter 6 and chapter 3 in the book of Daniel is giving us quite a contrast. Both scenes of believers under pressure. So you have chapter 3, faithfulness in the younger days. Chapter 6, faithfulness over time. Daniel's a little bit older. Chapter 3 was a general persecution. If you don't do this, then there will be consequences. You've got the bowing down to the statue, and then they end up in the fiery furnace. But it is a general type of persecution. Chapter 6 now is intensified. It is targeted at Daniel. So they go to King Darius with this trap. And verse 7 says that this trap is related to prayer. A decree is made that cannot be repealed. And prayer has got to do with loyalty. It's got to do with who you depend on. Who's the one you run to? Who's the one that is your support in these times? And the decree is made. And you can see this collision that is going to happen. The meats had no handbrake or steering wheel that could be changed. And this law is coming straight for Daniel. And Daniel will be left in this position where he can just turn to the side a little bit, just nudge away from God's way just a little bit to avoid this collision. What will Daniel do? What would we do? It's as if the Ford Fiesta is coming and this lorry of the maids is going to collide. What will he do? He in himself is so weak. But his ultimate loyalty is because of the ultimate God he has. It's not because of who he is. And it would be so tempting if you were Daniel just to, to change a little bit what the Bible says. Daniel could, could have given his commitment to the Medes. It's only 30 days, someone might say. And then he could be fully committed to God after that. It's only 30 days. But it fails to grasp what prayer is. He's being told to pray, to depend on something else other than God. Prayer is an action that expresses our dependence on God. And if we pray little it means we depend little on God. Our prayer life is an expression of our ultimate loyalty, of whether we consider our God to be our ultimate in our lives. I, I remember being in Africa a number of years ago, and we go on a, on a safari, and you go around and see different animals. And those animals, when you're a little boy, are really quite scary. They're not scary when you have something greater that you can depend on. For example, when you see the lions, a little boy and a lion, that's scary. Not when you've got a fence, because I was able to depend on something greater than me, so I wasn't scared. Or when you're in the, the van and you've got the, the guide with you and he's got some protective equipment, if something attacked you and you see the rhino, well, I'm not scared because I'm depending on something greater than myself. And that is what we're going to see. Daniel is depending on something greater than himself. And if we think, I could face the lions. Well, the sad reality is, if we think we can face the lions by ourselves, in fact, a different lion has got us. And we'll see who that lion is later on. So what will Daniel do? The, the tension is there. The trap is set. And the story now goes, thirdly, to the trust in verse 10. Where is your loyalty, Daniel? What will he do? We're not, I think, in a time of intense persecution in Ireland. Um, there, there are still a lot of freedoms, but I think the direction of travel is towards that. The pressures are rising. But in verse 10, what we see is Daniel was prepared. Uh, verse 10 indicates nothing really changes in his life. He just goes on doing what he's always 
been doing, and it expresses the trust that he has in God. Uh, way back in chapter 1, verse 8, it, early on, you see this incident where it talks about that he had resolved in his heart. He was prepared. And chapter 6 is he's prepared. He's just going on doing what he does. Uh, I changed the, the lyrics of a, of a familiar song, um, Dare to Be a Daniel. Um, here's my version of that song. Sorry if you love that song, and I've sort of changed the lyrics. Prepare to be a Daniel. Prepare to stand with God. Prepare to have a purpose firm. Prepare to make him known. Daniel is prepared from verse 10. He is ready. Are we ready? He was dependent on God. Are we dependent on God? And let's see what Daniel didn't do. You know, this guy was the administrator. He had wonderful problem-solving skills, and he worked with some very challenging bosses. Nebuchadnezzar, if you read about him and Daniel, he wasn't that reasonable a boss, but Daniel had worked with him. But Daniel didn't run to his previous successes. He didn't run to his administrative skills. He ran to his God in prayer. He could have said, oh, it's only 30 days After that, I could do so much. He didn't say that. He could have said, I have no friends to help me. When they were in the the fiery furnace, at least they were together. I'm by myself in this story. He didn't say that. And he could have said in his latter years, I've been loyal all of these years. Can I not just finish off with a little bit easier? No. He trusted. And I, and I, I find prayer difficult. And I can make excuses But here's the bottom line, I think. When I don't pray, what I'm saying is I depend on other things more than my God. Daniel was a man of prayer because he got that he was a man of need. There's a little comment at the end of verse 10 that is so important. Three times a day he gets down to pray, giving thanks to his God. And then verse 11, actually, praying and asking God for help. Do you see that he gets his need? Daniel was a man of prayer because he was a a man who got his need. And ultimate loyalty is because you get that God is the ultimate. He is the one that will provide your ultimate needs. He was the only God, the only God. And when the decree came to not pray, it was as if Daniel was being told, don't breathe. And in Daniel's mind, I need this need this. And when I don't pray, it's because I don't think it's essential that I'm independent to God. Daniel was loyal to God because Daniel got he needed him. And I want to ask then, how is your prayer life? Do you think that you're prepared for the pressure as it arises? Do you express your utter dependence on God? Because if we don't, what we are saying is we don't really need God. We need him a bit, but we don't really need him. Essentially, he's not number one in our lives. He's not the ultimate. But for Daniel, there was ultimate loyalty because he got that God was ultimate for him. Daniel needed to pray because he got that he needed God, God, this the God who is the eternal one, who reigns, who is all-knowing, all-powerful, ever-present, infinite in love, infinite in His sovereignty. It is this God that is our God. And when we approach Him to pray to Him, we receive all that we need, ultimate loyalty, because we get who our ultimate God is. And his God had been so loyal to him. Daniel could have run to his administration skills, but he didn't. He ran to God in prayer. End of verse 11. He ran to God for help. And I don't pray because I think I can do it myself on so many occasions, which is wrong. And I, and I use up so much anxious energy trying to fix that problem. You had that before. You have this thing in your life, and you just want to fix it. And you go round and round in your mind, I'll fix it, I'll fix it, I'll fix it. And prayer seems to be the last thing that we go to. We depend on so many other things. But Daniel depended on the Lord. 
that he trusted in the Lord with all his heart and leaned not on his own understanding. How I lean on my own understanding and that just fails. So, so when the challenge comes for living as a Christian, where do you run? And a church that doesn't pray much will not stand. It'll compromise. Open doors uh, in the world. Watch list in 2020. One in seven are persecuted worldwide. One in five Christians in Africa. Two in five Christians in Asia. How did Daniel and how will those persecuted brothers and sisters in those places stay loyal? Well, it's ultimate loyalty because they get that God is the ultimate. When they see who God is, that is how they can remain loyal. That's Daniel's trust, the tension, the trap, the trust. And then finally, the triumph, verses 11 to 28, as the story finishes. And in this story, it seems that evil is in control. It seems as if it is going to triumph, but it isn't the case. Daniel is accused, and, and the king can't do anything about it. Uh, verse 14, as, as you're reading this story, the king seems so powerless. Daniel, I want to save you. I'm going to try and rescue you, but he can't do anything. And I, when I read that as, a, as my younger days, I used to think, oh, the king's just a decent bloke. He's trying to do something. I'm not sure that's maybe the case, because if you remember the start of the story, Daniel was really good at his job so that the king would not suffer loss. So he doesn't want to lose Daniel because... He's a good guy that does a good job. But this king can't rescue. This king hasn't got a secure kingdom that he can save Daniel for. And so, verse 15 says, the law can't be changed. In verse 7, a stone covers, in effect, Daniel's tomb. And it's sealed with the authority of the king. And it notes that Daniel's situation cannot be changed. And Daniel's put in the pit. Imagine for a moment what it would have felt like as he went down there. Knowing what lions do, their claws, and their teeth. And the king, Darius, is powerless to do anything. The situation cannot be changed. And he says, I hope that your God can rescue you. And Daniel's God does ultimately rescue him. And verse 23 gives the conclusion of what has been going on when he is rescued. Because, end of verse 23, he had trusted in his God. There was the triumph, the ultimate triumph. And in verse the story goes on then to say how the men and the families who falsely accused were put into the den. Daniel was saved and they were destroyed. It's remarkable, isn't it? It's going to be a den of one of two things, either a den of salvation or a den of destruction. The faithful go through the den. They don't avoid the den, but are saved. And the unfaithful who avoid the den in the early stages of the story will not ultimately avoid it. The triumph took Daniel through the den, the suffering, but God ultimately rescued him. And in verse 25 and 27, you get this exclamation of Darius of praise to the God of Daniel, of his kingdom being an everlasting kingdom that he rescues, he saves, he has rescued Daniel. The glory is presented to the God of Scripture. And it, and it reminds me of Matthew 8, of all authority in heaven and earth has been given to the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, go and make disciples, declare this message of rescue and salvation, what it means to live under the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's, a, there's a, a sketching of the pattern of the Lord Jesus Christ's experience. Remember Christ, the Gospels talk about him as the innocent one who suffered. As Pontius Pilate is assessing the evidence, he's saying this man is innocent. There are no grounds for the charge. Yet he went through the den of the cross. And the stone was rolled away. And the Lord Jesus Christ, after three days, rose victorious. 
from the den. Jesus rose from the, the grave. Christ suffered to free us from the power of darkness and dominion of sin. And we often think that we're the Daniels in the story. But by nature, we're actually the satraps and the administrators who are opposed to God's righteous one, his innocent one. But here's the good news of the gospel. That we can be brought. We can be declared righteous because of the Lord Jesus Christ. We can be declared innocent because of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We can be brought out of that den of destruction into a den of salvation because of the Lord Jesus Christ. That he went to the den of the cross and rose again. And it doesn't mean that Christians won't suffer. This text is not a proof text for health and wealth. No. It's a triumph that is ultimate in glory. Christians will suffer in the den, yet in Christ they win in the end. Living faithfully to God in dependence in Him causes opposition, but God will save His faithful in the end. Revelation 1 begins verse 10. It gives this picture of, of Christians suffering persecution, yet they win in the end. They will be triumphant. Evil will not win. And there are two disciples in the New Testament to give us a picture of this loyalty. You have Judas, who betrayed King Jesus and who ended up in the den of destruction. Or you have Peter. Peter's so encouraging. You know, you know when he's told, they ask him, will you be loyal to me, Peter? And Peter says, yeah, 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 I will be loyal to you. He's dependent on himself. He's so impressed about himself. And then three times he denies the Lord Jesus. The patience of our God. And Jesus restores him. And he wanted to teach Peter something about loyalty. This loyalty is not dependence on us. It's dependence on God. And Peter would learn this lesson. That ultimate loyalty is because of the ultimate God we have. And Peter learned this. Let me, let me read as we close words in 1 Peter. Years later, talking to Christians who, had, who were suffering and experiencing great pain. This is what it says in chapter 2. And remember the story of Peter, of his life and how he would learn. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps, following the path of suffering to glory. That's the, the dominant idea of the book of 1 Peter. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth, talking about the Lord Jesus. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in the body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. For by his wounds we have been healed. For you are like sheep going astray. Do you see the, the echoes of Daniel 6, of, of the suffering, of entrusting yourself, following in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it is leading to glory, to ultimate triumph. So think of the believer today who is starved, beaten, mocked. They were the successful business person, but they, they lost it all because they followed Jesus and they were ultimately loyal to him. Daniel 6 and its reality matters of that triumph. Or think of the worker who's under some disciplinary procedures because they hold to a position on the Bible. In that moment, the realities of Daniel 6 are going to become very real. The tension, the trap, the trust, but the triumph. The Christian is called to faithfully endure. And it's not in their own strength, but a dependence on him. Because the story of Daniel 6 is ultimate loyalty because of the ultimate God they serve. And if I'm not praying, I'm indicating where my dependence is. We're loyal to him if you're following the Lord Jesus because he's loyal to us. And if you're not a believer here this morning, whose side are you on? The Lord Jesus welcomes you 
to come to him and receive this salvation to be declared innocent and righteous before God. Not because you've done anything, but he has done it all. We all have loyalties. You will have loads in your life. But they do collide. What is your ultimate loyalty? Where is your ultimate loyalty? Because this loyalty of Daniel 6 is a loyalty that lasts. All other loyalties will not last. But this loyalty lasts. It's loyalty amongst the lions. Amen. Let me pray and then hand back. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can approach your throne, that you reign and you rule and you're supreme and you're sovereign over all things. And we recognize that the pressures are rising in our land, the persecution is increasing throughout the world. But we ask that you would help us to be faithful, to be loyal to our Savior who gave us life and life to the full. Forgive us for the times where we've, we've let you down, but we thank you for the example of Peter, who, though he failed you, you gave grace upon grace. We need your help. In Jesus' name, amen.